Chapter 42 The second day of the Battle of Avalon belonged to Ander Elisadel. It was a day of blood and pain, of death and courage. All during the night, the demon hordes had continued to ferry their brethren across the waters of the real song, singly and in groups, until for the first time since their break from the forbidding, the whole of their army was gathered to strike, massed at the base of the Carolan, from cliff face to riverbank, stretched north and south as far as the eye could see, awesome and terrible and endless in number. At dawn they attacked the city, up against the walls of the Elfish they rushed, wave upon wave, maddened and howling with hate. Up against the heights they surged, scrambling on to the sheer rock, clawing their way through a hail of arrows. Onward they came, like a wave that would sweep across the defenders who waited and, and leave them buried. It was, Elander, it was Andrew Elisadel who made the difference. It was as if on that day he became at last the king his father had been, the king who had led the elves against the armies of the warlock lord fifty years past. Gone was the weariness and disillusion, gone was the doubt that had haunted him since Haley's cut. He believed again in himself and in the determination of those who fought with him. It was an historic moment and the elven prince became its focal point. Gathered about him were the armies of four races, battle standard, flying in morning wind. Here were the silver eagle, war eagles, and spreading oak of the elves. The grey and crimson sash of the free corpse, and the black horses of the old guard. There flew the forest greens of the dwarf sappers, split by the twist of the silver river. And the hammer and twin blue mountains of the rock trolls of the Kisholt. Never before had they flown as one. In the history of the four lands, the races had never been ununited in a common cause, to form a common defence and to serve a common god. Troll and dwarf, elf and man. The humans of the new world stood together against an evil from ancient times. For well, that single wondrous day, and a lesserdale became the spark that gave him all life. He was everywhere at once. From the rim of the bluff to the gates of the elfish, sometimes on horseback, sometimes afoot, always where the fighting was the heaviest, chain mail gleaming, Alcry's staff held high. He stood foremost among the defenders of the city against the demons who rushed to slay him. Wherever he went, the cry went up, and the defenders rallied, always outnumbered, always pressed. Still, the elven prince and his comrade at arms threw back their attackers. Ander Elisadel was something more than human that day, fighting with such ferocity that it seemed as if nothing could stand against him. Time after time the demons sought to pull him down, recognising quickly that the single man was the heart of the elven defence. Time after time it seemed as if they would succeed, ringing Ander in a swarm of raging black bodies, but each time he fought his way free. Each time the dream the demons were driven back. It was a day of heroes, for all of the defenders of Avalon were inspired by the courage of the elven prince. Even tiny Lissadel stood with his son and fought bravely, his very presence lending heart to the elves about him. Alanon was there as well, his cloak form standing head and shoulders above the armoured men about him, as the blue fire arched from his fingers into the midst of the raging demons. Twice the demons broke through the gates of the third ram, and twice the rock trolls under the command of Amantar drove them back again. Steve Jans and the men of the Free Corp broke a third assault, counter-attacking counter with such savagery that they swept the demons all the way back to the second ramp and for a time threatened to retake its gate. Elven cavalry and dwarf sappers repulsed Sally after Sally along the rim of the Carolan, throwing back scores of demons who managed to scale the cliff face and threatened to flank the defenders of the Elfish. But it was Ander who led them. Ander, who gave them renewed strength when it seemed that they could no longer. Ander, who rallied them at every point. When the day at last was ended and darkness began to fall, the demon forced to withdraw once more, slipping back into the forest below the heights, shrieking with rage and frustration. For yet a second day, the defenders of Avalon had held. It was Ander Elisadel's finest hour. Then the fortunes of the defenders of the city took a turn for the worse. With the coming of night, the demons attacked again, waiting only until the sunlight was gone, then rising up out of the forest to sweep over the elven defence. 
One by one, they extinguished the torches that had been lit along the lower Elthage, battling their way forward to the gates of the third ramp. Desperately, the defenders braced for the assault, massive rock trolls blocking the gates while elves and legion soldiers fought from atop the wall. But the rush was too strong. The gates buckled and snapped apart. Into the breach surged the demons, clawing their way forward. In the heights as well, the demons began to break through. Dozens of black forms slipped between the lines of cavalry, patrolling the bluff and scattered wildly towards the city of these. Of these, more than a hundred converged on the Garden of Life, aware that within its gates stood the thing that for so many centuries had held them in prison. There they came face to face with the soldiers of the Black Watch, who stood ready to fulfil the purpose of their order and to defend to the last man, the ancient tree that was their trust. Maddened beyond reason, the demon attacked. Up against the lowered pikes of the Black Watch, they charged and were cut to pieces. At the southern end of the caravan, another band of demons managed to tunnel beneath a line of dwarf traps set along the dismantled secondary stairway leading up on the real song and thus gained the heights. Girding the Black Watch in the Gardens of Life, they slipped east away from the caravan crawling through the shadows behind the line of torches set against its rim and broke for the city. Half a dozen of them wounded, en route to their homes from the battle, were caught in the open and killed. More might have perished, but for a patrol of dwarf swap sappers who had agreed to aid the elves in keeping watch along the perimeter of the city. Realising that the demons had broken through the defenders of the bluff, they followed the cries of the dying and fell upon their slayers. When the struggle was ended, only three dwarves were still standing. All the demons lay dead. By dawn, the heights had been cleared and the demons thrown back once more. But the third ramp of the Elfitch had been lost and the fourth was threatened. At the base of the bluff, the demons massed anew. Cries rang out through the morning stillness as they charged up the ramp, solidly massed. The foremost among them bearing a massive wooden battering ram. Into the gates they carried the ramp smashing the wooden barrier apart, then pouring through. Trolls and elves formed quickly into tight phalanx, a wall of iron spears and lances that cut deep into the writhing black form. But the demons came on, surging up against the harried defenders until they had, until they had forced them back within the fortress of the fifth ramp. It was a desperate moment. Four of the seven levels of the elf, elfish had been lost. The demons were halfway to the summit of the bluffs and rallied the defenders. Flanked by Amantar and Kirin and surrounded by home guard, the demons charged, hammering against the gates of the ramp. But just when it seemed that they must break through, Alanon appeared on the walls, arms lifting, blue flames raced the length of the ramp. Below, splitting wide the demon rush, turning the battering ram to ash. Momentarily stunned, the demons fell back. All through the morning, the demons sought to breach the elven defence of the fifth rim. At midday, they finally succeeded. A pair of monstrous ogres pushed to the forefront of their brethren and threw themselves against the gates. Once, twice, wooden iron shattered into fragments and the gates broke apart. The ogres burst through the ramp beyond, scattering the defenders. A handful of rock trolls tried to stop them, but the ogres shoved the trolls aside as if they were made of paper. Again, Ander rallied its soldiers, ur urging them forward. But demons were pouring through the ruined gates now, sweeping over the defenders. Then Eventine Elisadale's horse was killed beneath them as he rode back toward the safety of the gates above, and the old king tumbled to the rampway. The demons saw him fall. With a howl, they surged forward. They would have had him, but for Stejans. With a scattering of legion free corps, the border men sprang into their path, swords cutting behind them. Eventine staggered to his knees, dazed and bloody, but alive. Quickly, Kirin brought the home guard to the king's rescue and they carried him from the battle. The soldiers of the free corps held for a moment longer. Then they too were swept aside. The demon pushed forward, thrusting past the orbs who had tried to bar their way, leading the assault with the ogres who had forced the gate, crushing all who came within reach. And Elisabel, Leaped to stop them, Elkry's staff raised high as he called to the defenders of the city to stand with them, but the rush was too strong. Amantar and Stejans were fighting for their lives at the walls of the ramp. Unable to reach the Elven Prince for one terrifying moment, 
He stood virtually alone before the demon rush, but only for a moment. Atop the gates of the sixth court, Alanon whistled Dane down from the edge of the caravan without a word. He snatched Dancer's rein from the surprise wing rider and vaulted atop the giant rock. In the next instant, he was winging downward, black robe bellowing out like sails. Dancer screamed once, then dropped into the midst of the demons who threatened Anda, claws and beak tearing, shrieking. The black form scattered, blue fire spurted from the droid's fingers, and the ramp before him erupted in flame. Then pulling in an astonished Ander up beside him, the droid called out the dancer, and the rock lifted back into the air. Below, the last of the defenders fell back, pouring through the gates of the sixth ramp to safety. For a few seconds longer, the droid fire burned, then sputtered and died. Enraged, the demons charged after the fleeing defenders, but by now the dwarf sappers on the heights had been alerted. Winches and bullies began to turn as the chains wrapped about the supports of the ramp were drawn tight. Browick's carefully concealed trap was about to be sprung. Out from beneath the offage flew the already weakened supports, crackling and snapping as the chains twisted them three. With a shudder, the ramp head below the sixth level sank downward and fell apart. The demons caught upon it, disappeared in a cloud of rubble, Shrieks and cries filled the air, and the whole of the lower ramp was lost from view. When the dust cleared again, the offage was a pile of crushed stone and shattered wood beams from the gates of the sixth ramp downward to the fourth. Demon bodies lay scattered on the cliff face, lodged within the rubble, broken and lifeless. Those who had survived fell back toward the base of the bluff, dodging boulders and breeze and debris that tumbled down about them. Disappearing finally into the woodlands below, the demons did not come again that day against the city of Arbalon. Suffering from yet another head wound as well as from a number of smaller cuts and scrapes, Eventine Lesserdale was carried from the battle atop the elf fitch to the seclusion of his manor house. Faithful Gael was therefore to care for him, to wash and dress his wounds and to help him to his bed. Then with Darden and Rowe to watch over him, the king of the elves was left to sleep. But Eventine did not sleep. He could not. He lay within his bed, propped up against the feathered pillows, staring disconcertedly into the darkened corners of the room. Despair washing through him. For all the help that the legion, the dwarves and the rock trolls had given the elves, the battle was still being lost. All of the defenders had failed. Another day, perhaps two, and the sixth and the seventh gates of the Elfitch would fall and the demons would be atop the Carolan. That would be the end. Hopelessly outnumbered, the defenders would swiftly overrun. It would be swiftly overrun and destroyed. The whistling would be lost and the elves scattered to the four lands. The implication behind what he was thinking burned through him. If the demons won here, it would mean that even tiny Lesserdale had failed, not just his own people, but the peoples of all the lands. But the demons would not stop with the Westland, now that they were free of the forbidding, and what of his ancestors who had imprisoned the demons so many centuries ago at a time so remote that he could barely envision its being. He would have failed them as well. They had created the forbidding, but they had entrusted its care to those who followed after them depending on those who came after to keep it strong. Yet the forbidding had been forgotten over the centuries in the upheaval of the old world and the rebirth of the races. Forgotten by them all, even the Chosen had come to think of it little as more than a distant part of their history, a legend that belonged to another age, to the past or to the future, yet never really to the present. His throat tightened. If Arbalon fell, if the Westland were lost, it would be his failure. His, his penetrating blue eyes turned hard with anger. For 82 years he had lived upon this earth. For more than 50 of them, he had been the, healer, the leader of his people. He had accomplished much in that time, and now it would be all lost. He thought of Arian, his firstborn, the child who should have lived to carry on what he had worked so hard to achieve, and of Kael Pindanan, his old comrade at arms, his loyal follower, he thought of the elves who had been lost defending the Sarandanan and Abalon, all of them dead and for nothing. He eased himself down within the coverings of the bed, mulling over the choices that were left, the tactics 
that might yet be employed, the resources that might be called upon when the demons came again. His mind filled with them, with deep, and deep within he felt a sense of hopelessness. They were not enough. They would never be enough. Groping for answers to the questions he posed himself, he suddenly remembered Amberly. It startled him to think of her, and he sat upright in the bed. In the confusion of the past few days, he had forgotten his granddaughter. She, who was the last of the chosen, who Alanon had told him was the only real hope for his people, what he wanted sadly had become of Amberly. He lay down again and stared through the shadow of the drapes to the growing darkness beyond. Alanon had said that Amberley was alive, by now deep within the lower Westland, but Eventine did not believe what the Jord really knew. The thought depressed him. If she were dead, he did not want to know. He decided suddenly it would be a better way not knowing, yet that was a lie. He needed to know desperately. Bitterness whirled up within him. Everything was slipping away from him. His family, his people, his country, everything he loved, everything that had given meaning to his life. There was a basic unfairness to it all that he could not understand. No, it was more than that. The basic unfairness of it all was something he could not accept. If he did, he knew that it would finish him. He closed his eyes against the light. Where was Amberley? He must know. He insisted stubbornly. He must find a way to reach her, to help her if his help were needed. He must find a way to bring her back to him. He took a deep breath, then another. Still thinking of Amberley, he drifted off to sleep. It was dark when he awoke. At first he was not certain what it was that brought him awake. His mind still drugged with sleep, his thoughts scattered. A sound, he thought, a cry. He raised himself up against the gathering of pillows and stared into the darkness of the room, pale. White moonlight seeped through the fabric of the drawn curtains, illuminating faintly the lines of the bolted double windows. Uncertain, he waited. Then he heard another sound, a muted grunt, quick and surprised, fading almost instantly into silence. It had come from outside his room, from the hall where Darden and Rose stood watch. He sat up slowly, peering into the gloom, straining to hear something more. But there was only the silence, deep and ominous. Eventine slid to the edge of the bed and dropped one leg cautiously to the floor. The door to his bedchamber swung sl- slowly open, light from the oil lamps of the hallway beyond spilling into the room. The Elven King froze. Through the opening came Mance, heavy body, hunched forward in a low crouch, grizzled head swinging to where his master sat upon the bed. The wolf found eyes glittered like cats, and his dark muzzle was streaked with blood. But it was his forelegs and paws that startled the king most. They seemed in the half light to have become the corded limbs and claws of a demon. Mance passed from the light of the oil lamps into shadow, and even time blinked in surprise. In that instant he knew, he was certain, that what he had seen was something left over from a dream. That he had imagined that Manx was not Manx, but something else. The wolf hound moved toward him slowly and the king could see that his tail was wagging in a friendly manner. He exhaled in relief. It was just Mance, he told himself. Mance, good boy, he started to say and stop as he caught sight of the reddened tracks that the dog had left on the floor behind him. Then Manx was springing for his throat, quick and silent, jaws gaping wide, clawed hands reaching, but Eventime was quicker, snatching the coverings of the bed before him. He caught Manx within their folds, twisting the covering about the struggling dog. The king slammed the animal down hard upon the bed and sprang for the open door. <coughs> Excuse me. In an instant, he was through, yanking the door shut behind him, hearing the latch snap into place. Sweat ran down his body. What was happening? In a daze, he stumbled back from the door, nearly tripping over the lifeless body of Roe, who lay sprawled half a dozen feet away. His throat ripped open. Eventine's mind whirled. Mant. Why would Mant? He caught himself sharply. But it was not Mant. Whatever it was that had come at him within a sleeping chamber it was not Mant. Just something that looked like Mant. Numb, he stared down the hallway, searching for Darden. He found him near the front entry, a lance driven through his heart. Then the door to his bedchamber burst open. 
and the thing that looked like meant yet surely was not, bounded into view. Frantic, Eventine sprang for the entry doors, wrenching at the handles. They were jammed, the lock sealed. The old king turned, watched as the beast in the hall stalked slowly toward him. Reddened jaws gaping, fear surged through Eventine. Fear so terrible that for an instant it threatened to overwhelm him completely. He was trapped within his own house. There was no one here to help him, no one that might turn to. He was alone. Down the length of the hall, the monster came. The sound of its breathing, a slow rasp in the silence. A demon, Eventine thought in horror. A demon pretending to be man, faithful old man. He remembered then, awaking after the fall of the Sarandanan, to find Mance and thinking suddenly, irrationally, that it was not Mance at all, but something else. An illusion, he had thought. But he had been wrong. Mance was gone. Dead, he guessed, for many days, even weeks. Then the awful truth dawned on him. His meetings with Alanon, the plans they had worked so hard to keep secret, the care they had taken to protect Amberley. Mance had been there. Or the demon that looked like men. There was a spy within the elven camp Alanon had warned. A spy that all the while had been as close to them as they had been to each other. The old king thought of the times that he had stroked that grizzled head and it made his skin crawl. The demon was less than a dozen feet from him now, inching along the floor. Jaws open, clawed forelegs bent. Heaven I knew in that instant that he was a dead man. Then something happened within him, something so sudden that the Elven King was blinded to everything else. Rage swept through him, rage at the deception that had been done to him, rage at the deaths that had occurred because of that deception. Most of all, rage at the helplessness he felt now. Trapped, he was within his own house. His body went taunt. Next to the fallen Darden row, Darden lay the short sword, it had been the elven hunter's favourite weapon, keeping his eyes fixed upon those of the, of the demon. Eventine inched away from the doors. If he could manage to reach that sword, the demon came at him suddenly, bounding across the space that separated them, launching himself at the elven king's head. Eventine brought his arms up to protect his face and fell backward, kicking violently. Teeth and claws ripped into his forearm, but his feet caught the underside of the creature and sent it tumbling past him into the darkened recesses of the entry. Quickly he rolled back to his feet, throwing himself over Darden and grasping the falling sword. Then he was up again, turning to face his attacker. Astonishment flooded his face. From the darkened corner where he had tumbled, the demon slouched, no longer meant, but something different now. It was changing even as it stalked toward him. Changing from mance into a lean, black thing, Caught with muscle, its body sleek and hairless. It came at him on four legs that ended in clawed hands, and its mouth split wide with gleaming teeth, circled the king, lifting itself from time to time on its hind leg, fainting with its hands like a boxer, hissing with hate, a changeling even time thought, and forced down a new wave of fear, a demon that could be anything it wanted to be. The changeling lunged at him suddenly, claws ripping at his shoulder and thigh, leaving him torn and bloody. He swung at the thing with the sword. Too late. It was past him and gone. Before he could reach it, back the demon circled slowly, like a cat watching its cornered prey. I must be quicker this time, the old king told himself. The demon lunged again, fainted at his chest and slipped beneath the arc of his sword, tearing at the muscle of the left leg. Pain shot through the leg and he dropped to his knee struggling to remain upright. For an instant, his vision blurred, then cleared once more as he forced himself to rise. Before him, the changeling crouched, warning, waiting. When he stayed on his feet, it began to circle once more. Blood streamed down Eventine's body and he felt himself weakening. He was losing this battle as well, he thought frantically, and it would end in his death if he did not find a way to take the offensive against this monster. Weaving and bobbing, the demon stalked him. The king tried to corner it, but it stepped nimbly away from him. Far too quick for the wounded old man, Eventine stopped his pursuit. He was gaining him nothing. He watched as the demon continued to circle, hissing. 
Then in a desperate gamble, the elven king pretended to stumble and fall, staggering heavily on his knees. Pain shot through him as he did so, but the deception worked, thinking the old man finished the changing lunge. This time, Evan time was waiting. He caught the monster in the chest, the sword biting deep through the bone and muscle. Shrieking in pain, the demon clawed and bit at the elven king. Then twisted free, blood ran from the slash, a greenish red ichor that stained the sleek black body. They crashed face to face, elven king and demon, both wounded, each waiting for the other to drop his guard. Once more the demon began to circle, blood trailing after it along the floor. Even tiny Lassadale braced, turning to follow the demon's movement. He was covered with blood and his strength was ebbing from him. Pain racked his torn body. He knew that he could only last a few minutes more. Abruptly, the changeling sprang at his throat. It happened so quickly that the king did not have time to do much more than stumble backward. Arms raised before his face, sword held high. The demon landed on top of him, bearing him to the floor. Teeth and claws ripping. Eventine screamed in pain as the claws tore into his chest and the jaws closed about his forearm. Then the doors to the manor house burst open. Locks splintering, hinges ripped from their fastening, shouts rang through the darkened entryway as it filled with armed men. In a haze of anguish, Eventide cried out, someone had heard, someone had come. From atop the fallen king, the changeling rose up, shrieking, in that instant it left its roast exposed. Eventide's sword swept up, glittering. Back flew the demon, head nearly severed from its body, its voice lost in a sudden gasp as it fell. The king's rescue was closed in about it, sword thrusting deep in it, into its body. The changeling shuddered, and with the impact of the blows, died. Eventine Lassadell staggered to his feet, sword still clutched within his hand. Blue eyes hard and thick, a numbing sensation spread through his body as he turned to find Ander reaching out for him. Then the king of the elves tumbled downward, and the night closed in.